Um, do you guys want to, let's do a little montage while I go find some stuff. Why have we got so many skeletons around? It's just that part of the lab, I guess. Back in a minute. I need one of these. I reckon, I reckon that's probably all we need. So, hey look, I'm wearing a shirt again. Students coming back next week. Should probably trim this beard. Look a bit more respectable for our new uh, student intake. Um, all right, so we, in recent weeks, we've looked at some of the spaces in the thorax. We've looked at the mediastinum and the spaces in there. Uh, we looked at the pleura a while ago. There's another space we haven't looked at yet, and it's the one that's directly surrounding the heart. And really, it's not so much the space as much as the connective tissues. It's the pericardium. Of course, Whenever we're dissecting, whenever we're making lovely models, we tend to remove most of the connective tissue to show the viscera, the organs and the structures. But you guys need to know about the connective tissue because it's really important, it's what holds us together. But in relation to the heart, the pericardium is crucial to normal heart function and there are things that go wrong in relation to the pericardium which can cause devastating and lethal effects because the heart is kind of really important, right? What's, what's up with your eye? Like, oh, is this supposed to be a hook? Anyway, so um, if we're going to talk about the pericardium, we should talk about where it is, what its job is. And if you've looked at the pericardium, the thing you might have got unstuck on are the number of layers and how those layers are formed. So we'll try and untangle that mess. Uh, and we'll talk about how blood supply is <laughs> neither here nor there. Do a bit of innovation, um, and then we're into uh, stuff you might want to know about clinica Um And that's it. So you guys know how long this video is already. I don't because I haven't recorded it yet. But if we start off with then the first bit is where is it? So well, you know where the heart is, right? Pericardium is around the heart. Easy. Better description is that. Um, of the, of the mediastinum, which you know about because you've watched that video, the pericardium is forming the middle mediastinum. Um, the anterior mediastinum is anterior to the pericardium. The posterior mediastinum is posterior to the pericardium. So that's where the pericardium is. And it's surrounding the heart. And it's running from, here's the diaphragm here. So it's running from the diaphragm, the central part of the diaphragm that often gets called the central tendon. It's running from there, covering the heart, and it's going up as far as the roots of the great vessels here. So we've got superior vena cava, aorta, pulmonary trunk. Of course, we've taken it away, haven't we? Um, let's try and add it back. I didn't have any bags, so I'm using my usual bag of a, <laughs> of a glove, right? Um, extra large glove, extra small heart. So essentially, mm, it's going to be a bit of a... Whoa, I've torn my pericardium. It's not a million miles away. Um, be good if it went kind of up over there though, wouldn't it? Um, so there's a bit of a fudge because we've got to have a hole for the inferior vena cava. But essentially, there's a little non-latex um, pericardium. That's what it looks like when it surrounds the heart. So when we're dissecting, we open up the, 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 the thorax. Um, this is what we see. We see the connective tissue covering the heart. Um, if we cut through there, we tend to find a lot of fat covering the coronary arteries and stuff. So if you cut through here, you don't just magically see the heart. Now, that's where it sits. Now, what does it do? What do you reckon? Um, I think the most obvious job that the pericardium has is to anchor the heart in place. Sure, we've got the lungs over here, we've got the great vessels up here which are kind of fixed in place, but essentially the, the heart could slide around and twist and all sorts, right? The pericardium is, um, one of its layers is a thick, tough connective tissue and it's holding the heart in place. That connective tissue is it's kind of fixed in place, it doesn't stretch, whereas the heart of course does stretch and contract and shrink and yeah, moves around quite a bit, but the pericardium is fixed in place, so it's anchored, as I say, to the diaphragm down here. Um, it's also got some anchors to the sternum, which lies over the top. Uh, 
sternopericardial ligaments. And there's a few of those, they're a little bit variable. The pericardium then is held in place and it's holding the heart in place. And the other thing is, because of course we've talked about the pleural cavities and the mediastinum and the connective tissues around here, this is another layer of connective tissue that's compartmentalizing the heart and it continues to some of the other connected tissue structures, but it means that the heart is a little bit better protected from the spread of infection within the thorax, right? Now, because the outer layer of the pericardium is this thick, tough connective tissue that doesn't stretch, the other thing it's going to do is it's going to limit how much the heart can expand, right? The heart fills with blood, so it expands, and then it contracts and pushes the blood out. Um, so the pericardium limits the expansion of the heart. So it stops the heart from overexpanding. You imagine that the heart being a fairly soft tissue. If it fills really rapidly, it might overexpand and damage itself. So the pericardium stops that from happening. And the other thing is that it also has some lubricating layers in here. And we'll see that those layers are a bit similar to some of the other layers we've seen in the body. There's two layers, a little bit of fluid in between. Uh, and what that means is that um, we're creating a, a, a smooth, friction-free environment. So as the heart expands and contracts and expands and contracts, it's, it's lubricated, right? It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, in a super, it's, it's in a lubricated, super smooth environment, so it's nice and easy for the heart to expand and contract. That's the other job of the pericardium then. So let's have a look at the three layers that allow that to happen. So now, what about the structure of the pericardium itself? you may hear the pericardium described as having two layers or three layers. Both of those things are correct. <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds. The layer we can see here then, this outermost layer, this tough connective tissue layer, this would be the fibrous pericardium. So this is a... Builders? Busy? Yeah. Um, so this is your, your thick outer covering of pericardium. It stops the overexpansion of the heart. It fixes everything in place. That's the bit that's tied down to the diaphragm or what have you. That's the fibrous pericardium, the outermost layer. Um, now, underneath the fibrous pericardium, we have a second layer. And that second layer would be the serous pericardium. College of Medicine. I'll get another one. A bit more gently this time then. Do the bigger, softer balloon, really. Um, when we looked at the pleura and when we looked at the peritoneum, we saw that the pleura is two layers, but it's actually a single layer, and the peritoneum is also two layers, but actually a single layer. It's the same thing with the serous pericardium. These blooms don't look too healthy. What's those yellow stripy blooms? So what's actually happening there is you've got your single layer, but the... This is a, this is a really crap balloon. Do you ever get those days where, you, you know, you just wonder why you started? The serous pericardium is a single layer, but it doubles back on itself. Right? So, so the serous pericardium is essentially one layer, but because it folds back on itself, it makes two layers, which gives us the total of three layers. So the serous pericardium, if, we, if this is the fibrous pericardium, the serous pericardium is lining the fibrous pericardium, and the bit of the serous pericardium that's lining the fibrous pericardium is known as the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. Just as how the layer of pleura lining the thoracic cage is called the parietal pleura. Now, the, that, that serous pericardium up here, yeah, because this, this is in your bag, right? And it's up here that we kind of get this, it, it, we've got a hole, right, which the great vessels come out of. So up here at the great vessels, roughly around here, that, that serous pericardium then doubles back and it covers the heart. And where 
that serous pericardium covers the heart. It gets called the visceral layer of the serous pericardium because the heart is the viscera. Just as in the lungs, the layer of pleura covering the lungs is called the visceral pleura. All right. So that's why we have three layers of pericardium. The tough connective tissue of the fibrous pericardium and then two much thinner serous layers of serous pericardium which have a parietal layer and a visceral layer. But it's looping back on itself. That visceral layer of serous pericardium that's covering the heart, it's, it's covering the heart, it's stuck to the heart. And that also gets called the epicardium. So the heart's got three layers. It's got the endocardium lining the inside, nice and smooth. That's where the blood's flowing. It's got the myocardium, that's the muscle. And then on the outside of the heart, it's got this layer called the epicardium. The epicardium is the exact same thing as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So I understand how that can, you can easily get confused looking at all this stuff. But it's important. So, right, if I, um, now, 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 now. If I put, you'll see what I'm on about here. If I put two gloves on this heart, you have to use your imagination a little bit. Okay, so thinking about those layers then, when we, um, so if we're, if we're dissecting a cadaver, if we take off the, uh, the chest flail, if we take off the sternum and the ribs and we're looking inside here, we see this connective tissue here. This connective tissue covering the heart here is the fibrous pericardium. Now, if we cut through the fibrous pericardium, what we see there, we see the visceral layer of the serous pericardium because the parietal layer of the serous pericardium is actually lining the fibrous pericardium. Do you see? So we open up the fibrous pericardium and if we want to take the heart out, what happens is we take the heart out and what's left inside the cadaver is the fibrous pericardium lined by the parietal layer of the serous pericardium, right? And we've got our heart then, and our heart is covered, what we see here is the, the covering that's left is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. We also have a load of fat here, and we'd have the coronary arteries and that sort of thing. So, you know, you've got to use your imagination a little bit, all right? So if we, t yeah, yeah, I, you get it, you get it, you got it. Well, I'm making a bit of a mess, but there's um, nothing new there, right? Okay. So, just like in the pleura, with the visceral and parietal pleura, there's a space in between those two layers, right? With the visceral and parietal layers of serous pericardium, there's another potential space in between those two, a little bit of fluid in there. And that's your nice, that's how you get this nice friction-free, smooth expansion and contraction of the heart. So the pericardium, that's how it's allowing the heart to move nice and easily. So that's a good thing. This is also quite a cool thing and a trendy thing to be aware of right now, because there is a bit of work looking at the interactions between the epicardium and the myocardium or the visceral layer of the serous pericardium and the myocardium and how those two layers interact um, after a heart attack, after a myocardial infarction um, and in you know, repair and recovery of those tissues there are some reciprocal interactions going on there and also that epicardium or the visceral layer of the serous pericardium um, is a potential source of adult stem cells to help with repair of uh, the myocardium so this could be a really important structure in the future for, for, for medical stuff, right? Medical engineering. Now, the other thing we've got with the pericardium is uh, spaces. Well, sinuses or recesses. You know what, well, anatomists like to name everything, right? So where we have a little bit of a re recess or a pocket in this potential space between those two layers of serous pericardium, we'll give it a name. Um, now, the most important one is um, the transverse pericardial sinus, which I can't really demonstrate on here. I kind of really need a real heart. Um, can I do it on, on the other heart? No, 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 no. So because those layers of pericardium come up to the great vessels here and reflect, what you can do is you can stick your finger round 
the posterior part of the pulmonary trunk and posterior to the aorta and then it comes out here anterior to the superior vena cava mm -hmm. right so there's there's a, there's a space there in that potential space in between the layers of serous pericardium if you get your finger round and in around there you can grip the two outflow vessels of the heart you can you can grip the two outflow you can get your finger around there so you can also get a bit of string around there and ligate it so it's posterior to that it's behind it's behind these two guys but that's the transverse pericardial sinus so that can be useful to cardiothoracic surgeons that need to you know deal with these outflow vessels the other one is the oblique pericardial sinus and so if that's if the transverse pericardial sinus is like a tunnel right you can get your finger around the back of these guys the uh, oblique pericardial sinus is is a blind ending thing it's a cul-de-sac and it's it's around the back here it's 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 just it's just back there it's between the left and right uh, superior pulmonary veins right so it kind of comes in obliquely like that I'm not really helping. I'm not doing a very good job of describing those. There are a whole bunch of other recesses as well, but it's, if you get that idea of the transverse pericardial sinus being posterior to the two outflow vessels and then anterior to the superior vena cava, you've got it. The oblique one is just a bit... You can, to be honest, this is where you need to get your hands into a cadaver. And you do that and you, you know it, you got it. Uh, what about blood supply? <laughs> The pericardium is supplied with blood by lots of vessels nearby and is drained by other lots of vessels nearby. There's just a lot of blood vessels around there. It's just, it's not a list worth learning. Um, but the innovation is the pericardium, I kind of want to put a glove back on it now. The pericardium is innovated by, oh, I could just, the, uh, the phrenic nerve. Uh, what do you know about the phrenic nerve? What does the phrenic nerve innovate? Hmm? C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. The phrenic nerve innovates the diaphragm. And there's one on either side and they descend through the thorax. C345, so the phrenic nerve on either side um, forms from spinal nerves C3, C4 and C5 and then they drop down, they descend through the thorax and they, they blend with the, with the pericardium. When we're dissecting the thorax, you can kind of pull those nerves out of the pericardium. They blend with it, they disappear, so they, they carry sensory innovation back from the pericardium and they carry motor innovation to the diaphragm and sensory innovation back from the diaphragm, which means that the pericardium is sensitive to pain, just like the parietal pleura is and just like the ribs are. Um, and because the phrenic nerves are coming from C345 levels and because the C345 levels are producing nerves of the shoulder and the upper limb, right, they're getting involved in the brachial plexus, this means that pain in the pericardium tends to get referred to the tops of the shoulders on the same side. So if the pericardium on the left side hurts, then the, it tends to get referred pain over the top of the left shoulder because of that, that phrenic nerve, right? The brain is used to perceiving pain from the skin. It doesn't understand pain from the pericardium, so it thinks it's coming from up here. Um, so that's innovation. Okay, now what, go, what can go wrong with the pericardium? Well, there's the usual bits and bobs, you know, with infection and that sort of thing, but the big one, Probably the most important one is that if the fibrous pericardium is a tough connective tissue that doesn't stretch, what would happen if you started to collect fluid in the pericardial cavity, also known as the pericardial space? That's the potential space between the two layers of serous pericardium. What would happen if that started to have a bit too much fluid in it? Now you've already encountered something similar with the pleura. If the pleural space fills with fluid or fills with air, then you start to have problems with the lungs filling, don't you? Uh, and translating the movements of the thoracic cage to the lungs. Now, in the case of the heart, um, if that pericardial cavity starts to fill with fluid, we start to get a pericardial effusion or starts to fill with blood, um, hemopericardium, which could occur through trauma, but of course it could occur with damage to the to the myocardium with the myocardial infarction and, and that sort of thing, right? So if, if that potential space in the pericardial cavity starts to fill with fluid, then the space into which the heart can expand is gonna get smaller and smaller, 
right? The fibrous pericardium, that's, that's a fixed volume, and the heart normally fills it. But if the pericardial cavity is starting to fill with fluid, then the blood that's filling the heart, there's less space to fill into, right? So the heart stops being very effective. You can't fill the heart with blood, you can't pump as much blood. Um, this is likely to become lethal and because of the high pressures involved with the arterial side, um, this is a cardiac tamponade. Um, this means that this could get worse fast. So it's a medical emergency. Um, and not only is the heart not filling with blood and not being very effective at pumping blood around the body, so you might see effects because of that, but the, the blood vessels that are draining into the heart aren't able to drain into the heart as they normally would, so you start to get a bit of backflow. So you might start to see the veins of the, of the neck and the face starting to stand out a bit. I imagine there would be increased uh, jugular venous pressure, uh, which we've talked about before, right? Um, so cardiac tamponade, that's the real big risk of something going a bit awry in the, in the pericardium. All right, that's the pericardium. Um, a really important piece or layers of connective tissue. So whereas we normally let, remove these layers of connective tissue, that's a really important one to remember about. Um, right, I better probably better go and fill out some health and safety forms for these balloons. Sorry about the balloons if anybody's a bit balloon phobic. Uh, all right, see you next week.